I wake up with ideas and I dream about ideas. How important is the place when you're creating that sound? The Peter Gabriel record, uh, we made it in a cattle barn. Literally cows like pressing their faces up against the window. I visualize sound. It's like a blessing and a curse. I, I can never get away from it. And that was a big part of the, the sound that we got on, on the Edge's guitar. That we, we found the secret hallway. Imagine how many lives you've changed from that one room. If it's got soul and it gets put out there properly, you could touch a lot of hearts. Hey. Oops. Daniel Lenoir is a legendary music producer that has taken home the Grammy on three separate occasions for the album of the year. Rolling Stone magazine called him the most important record producer to emerge in the 80s. A list of artists he's worked with includes U2, Peter Gabriel, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Emmy Lou Harris, and Willie Nelson. He's also an accomplished musician in his own right, and it's a pleasure to sit down and learn from such an inventive and creative mind today in this incredible Los Angeles home. Were you first exposed to live or recorded music? I was first exposed to live music. Uh, I'm French-Canadian, and uh, uh, the way I came up as a kid, um, there were big gatherings on weekends, and it was pretty much a self-entertaining society. Uh, my father was a violoneur, which is a fiddler, mm. and uh, my grandfather was as well. So they'd bust out the violins once, you know, had a few drinks in them. And so there was a lot of singing and uh, carrying on, you know, just, just families hooking up, kids and all piled up in, in the bedrooms. And wow. I didn't get exposed to recorded music until maybe, um, I became a teenager, you know, I started hearing some pop songs and I mm -hmm. became interested in buying records. How'd you start learning about the world of music beyond your community? I guess radio was everything to me as a kid. Um, by the time that I'm, uh, time I moved from Quebec to Ontario, we moved to a place called Hamilton, it's a steel city, mm -hmm. uh, near Buffalo and not so far from Detroit. So I was able to hear a Toronto radio, but also a good American radio, because it was kind of the, the beginning of the uh, soul music explosion um, in the early 60s. Mm. And so I really liked listening to what was coming out of Motown. And um, I eventually got to work with Rick James, because um, he was hanging out in Toronto a lot. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a mutual friend, an organist uh, named Eddie Roth. And uh, Eddie introduced me to, to Rick, and so he did some demos in my mother's basement, which was quite fascinating. <laughs> now, dialing it back a little bit to where, like, when just a second ago you were saying that you guys had moved and it exposed you to, like, uh, different sounds, you started recording bands at 17. Is this right around the same time? And uh, was the goal from the beginning to be a producer or, like, or being a recording artist? You know, you're 17. Right. What are you, um, what are you thinking? Well, it started uh, much younger than that. Um, we always had a tape recorder around the house, mm -hmm. like a little flea market tape recorder. It had everything on it, speakers, microphone, and so you could, you could record and play it back right away, and mm -hmm. I thought that was fantastic. Um, so I got that tape recorder when I was about 12, 13. And then I was in uh, little neighborhood bands, and they started coming over to my house and record them, and they, uh, then over the years, I got better and better machines. So by the time I was 17, I had a whole studio set up. At 17? Yep. Wow. Okay, so did you get much of a choice in recording artists when you started out? Um, well, we didn't have very many connections. You know, we were in this isolated place. Uh, and so I just recorded whoever, um, whoever turned up, and I just tried to do the best work I could with them. And, and the word got out that you know, we were committed and, and doing some, some, some good music work. Um, and then the invitations became uh, a little more interesting. Mm. Um, and I had a, you know, a few, uh, few hit songs um, in Canada, the Parachute Club being one of them. And they were terrific people. Uh, um, they were from Toronto, and, and I was essentially recording all the hipster bands at that time, including a lot of the lesbian bands out of Toronto. And um, some of that work was very inventive, and these two girls that I was working with called the Time Twins um, went to New York City to, to see if they could meet some people, and they bumped into Brian Eno, and they played Brian 
some of the tracks we'd been working on. And he flipped out. He said, this is great. Where'd you record these? And they said, well, there's a kid in Canada. You know? So that's how that got hooked up. Is this right about the same time as your U2 work? And how did you, how did you transition from like children's music to like uh, U2? <laughs> well, the children's music happened in my mom's basement. And it was, uh, th this kid, Rafi, uh, became one of, the, one of the big artists in the world but doing ch children's music. So it's pretty funny. I think I, I recorded his, his entire first album for $1,500. Mm -hmm. But when I met Brian Eno, he came into my world with, um, he had a vision for this ambient music, instrumental music. And um, he had already recorded some piano recordings in New York and he brought them to me. And then we proceeded to uh, transfer them to my system and then build sounds on, on top of them. And I worked with him for about three or four years uh, on these ambient records, a very beautiful, um, atmospheric records and then he had an invitation to work with U2 and uh, so that's how the U2 thing happened but he didn't want to produce U2 he said um, I'm, I don't want to produce any bands right now and I I heard the demos and I said boy I'd really like to work with them could you make an introduction so that's how it happened we went to Dublin and met them and he didn't want to make the record but they talked him into it Bono's very persuasive yeah, he's been known to be. They put me and Eno in the backseat of a car and drove around Dublin and cranked up the sound and he sang over the tracks that they were working on. And wow. So the, his enthusiasm was so contagious that... Well, he was determined back then. Oh, he was determined back then, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> when you guys did the recording, did you guys go to, to like uh, Slane Castle or the houses up in the uh, Irish foothills to, to, to record? Yeah, the guys in U2 didn't want to record in a conventional studio. They wanted to find a more uh, um, fascinating location that might have um, more of an array of rooms to pick from for different sounds. And mm -hmm. coincidentally, in Canada, I had been experimenting with uh, the old library in town. Mm -hmm. The library had moved, mm -hmm. uh, and so they let me use the old building, which was a fantastic um, turn-of-the-century building with beautiful, uh, endless array of corridors and rooms and bathrooms. I, I got to experiment with um, a lot of live sounds, mm. uh, live sounding rooms. Um, and then when the call came, it all came into focus because uh, uh, I was able to bring that expertise to Ireland and then uh, they had chosen to work in Slane Castle. Mm. Um, so it was, it was sort of a... So that's the reason why the Joshua Tree sounds the way it does? The Unforgettable Fire is the first one I did with him, and that's, that's a quite an atmospheric record. So we, we took, you know, and I took our thing to them, and they were looking for uh, a new sound anyhow, so it, mm -hmm. it was a very good timing. And then we did the Joshua Tree not too long after that. Same, same process, not the castle this time, but a, a very, like a big old farmhouse, which was very beautiful. And, and powerful sounding as room is a big wooden room and I think it, it that big room had a lot to do with the the drum sound that we got and very loud in there so the energy was was strong it was the opposite of what you would feel in a suffocating studio right it was just very expansive so you you essentially you know got your vocational skill of uh, learning room sounds by using a library by using the library, yeah. <laughs> so basically, you can look in a room and you can basically tell what you'll be able to get out of it. I have a pretty good idea, and I, I've discovered that uh, unusual rooms will often have a, a great sound. Like kitchens are often good for you know sitting around with an acoustic guitar and working out songs. And it's like, if you've got a nice, nice vibe in a kitchen, well, you can record in the kitchen. It's all right. And uh, we found that um, tall, skinny hallways uh, are really good for guitar amps. So if you, if, you, uh, if you put a guitar amp at the end of a, of a hallway and you mic it further back, the, the, the hallway um, amplifies the sound of the amplifier so that the whole thing becomes like a speaker cabinet. And that was a big part of the, the sound that we got on, on the Edge's guitar, that we, we'd, we'd find the secret, we found the secret hallway. So we, uh, that's where we recorded his guitar. He went as far as measuring this particular little hallway sure. to replicate it wherever he went from there on. 
how important is the place when you're, when you're creating that sound? I think the location plays a big part in what you do. Um, one good thing about um, choosing an unusual location for the making of a record, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a commitment that is felt by the artist if you're setting something up special for them. And that commitment is contagious, so if, if, if one is seen to be very devoted to the project, then that will, you know, other people are gonna feel it and you'll get a snowball effect. I've always enjoyed that aspect of things. It'd be like, you know, a little bit like filming on, on location and bringing in your cameras and you're getting all, all revved up because you're excited about your location. And, you know, once you're done, you're done, you move on. But there, I think there's, there's something, there's an energy to be had at that point. And it's almost, you think of it like a paradigm, you know, the, um, the forces come into, um, the forces come to one point, and that hopefully that becomes the moment of strike, the moment you record. So there's, there's an awful lot that leads to that point of strike, and I see it as very important. It's what, it's, it's what I love about records, you know, when, when they reach me and they raise the spirit and the hair comes up on the arm, I know that they got their moment of strike right. Well, so you think your taste has changed since, uh, you know, over the decades as a, as a listener or a musician or producer? You think your taste in music has changed? Yeah, my taste in music has changed. Um, I, I used to like um, textural music quite a bit. I still like it, but I, I think I'm much better at bass lines now than I used to be back in the day. Mm. Coming out of Canada, um, I didn't have a lot of knowledge of, of bass, but I had a lot of knowledge of melody, so I wanted to learn more about the bass. Mm -hmm. and, I, that's, and I decided to go, um, aside from my work in Europe, I decided to go to New Orleans to learn, learn about the bass, and I went there to ma make a record with the, the Neville Brothers. And that was a fascinating uh, journey because it really broadened my education. I was able to have an understanding of where the bass lines came from, largely from the tuba, and then, you know, as, as instruments went more electric, uh, the meters came out of there. And I, I was able to, you know, hang with George Porter, the bass player from the meters. And so in a year's time, I learned so much about the bass. Right. And I was very, very grateful for having gone down there. And I, wow. and to, you know, I thank the Neville brothers. And, and I got to meet all their associates and Uncle Jolly. And, and uh, so the, the broadening of one's education will, will you know, cause you to change your taste. You know, that's right. just the way, that's evolution in life. You know? Rolling Stone called you, you know, one of the most important, um, or the, sorry, the most important record producers of the 80s. How do you feel when you hear, like, someone say that about you? You know, the, the 80s for me, I was so isolated that I, I had no idea what was going on in the world. I mean, I was very much into my technology and my laboratory, but I was so devoted to my work that... By the way, I'm going to use that. I'm now going to refer to my studio as my laboratory. <laughs> it's a good way to look at it. My laboratory. <laughs> it's a great way of looking at it. It's actually true, but I'm sorry. Yeah, I interrupted I'm sorry. You. I was just... Like, for example, you know, working in Ireland and working in England with Peter Gabriel, we were largely in the country. Um, and what was that like? Well, in the, the country? Yeah, yeah, the, the Peter Gabriel record. Uh, I made a record with him called So. It was a very big record. And we made it in a cattle barn. Um, the control room was nothing to look at. It's, and and it, it, literally cows like pressing their faces up against the window. Um, and so I had no idea what was going on in the world. I was just living in, in Peter Gabriel's bell tower and doing the best work that I could, and I, I loved him. I, I thought that he was um, one of the kindest people that I had met, and it really meant a lot to me to build a masterpiece for him. So uh, in a way, I shut everything off in my life, and I devoted a year of my life to Peter. And, and um, we made a, a very good record. It was a massive hit, and, and it just... So 
for me to think of the 80s, I can only look back now and see what else was going on in the 80s. Right. But as for myself, I was just in this one room. Imagine how many lives you've changed from that one room, from your laboratory. That's, well, that's a nice way to look at it, you know. The, but that's what happens with good work. Um, you know, you, if it's got soul and um, it gets put out there properly, you can touch a lot of hearts. So that's, that's the ultimate compliment, you know. But what do you think was the most impressionable, you know, time in your life where you learned something from a particular artist? Um, well, the, uh, um, I've learned from so many great artists. Um, um, during that New Orleans time, I had a chance to work with Bob Dylan. That was a very great lyrical journey. Um, I was quite advanced musically and always had a, an ear for the lyrics, but to sit down with Bob um, for the making of a record called Oh Mercy really opened my eyes to uh, song structure, rhyming scheme, um, repeating lyric device, um, the ins and outs of shape of song really came to me when I worked with Bob. So if you had to pick, um, and, and you've done a lot of songs, right? If you had to pick one song that you felt like defined you out of all your work, which would it be? Um, I mean, it's a super hard question because I don't think I could um, ever do that. Um, I like that song, One, uh, by you 2 And I had, you know, a fair bit to do with it because I was in the trenches with them at the time, with Brian Eno. And, uh, and we poured so much energy into that song, and so it was... Um, the shaping of it was a big part of, of its success. I think we, we just kept at it and we honed in on the arrangement and, and I played a guitar part on it. And so it's, it's quite dear to me and, uh, and it's a song that's touched a lot of hearts and it's a really heartfelt song. I think it, it, really, um, it really encompasses the U2 emotion. That beautiful, yearning, melancholic sound that, mm. that they're fantastic at. I think it, it really it, it's nicely brought to conclusion in that song. And that would be you? That would be me being involved with them, of course. You know. By saying that, I mean, like, you feel like that defines you. Well, oh, I see what you mean. Of course, yeah. Um, I can never get away from the mel melancholy. Okay. And uh, so that's why I get jealous when I hear party tracks that you get to the top of the charts doing a party track, so why can't I have a number one right now? But maybe I'm too melancholic or melodic, and you know, it's just my natural inclination. But I think that, that song defines that part of me for sure. Yeah. Now, tell me what a, a typical day in the studio is like with you. Um, is there like a ritual or? So the preparation is, is, is pretty much my whole thing. And I, I usually, if I'm producing a band, I usually come in in the morning and build some sounds so that when the band comes in, let's say in the afternoon, there's already something happening. They're not mm. just walking into thin air. Um, but what about for you, though? Like, where's your favorite? What's your station of choice when you're when you're doing that um, process? Is it on behind a, your steel guitar or is it behind the mixing board? Like, where's the best? Um, well, you know, I have. Um, Different technique. I, I always keep my steel guitar handy because it can, it's very liquid sounding and can provide me with a certain kind of direction for a day. But then I, I keep beats. I have a, a, a beat orphanage, a melody orphanage, and a lyric orphanage with these little boxes where uh, things live that I put some work into, but they've not found a song home yet. Um, yet another great term for something that I completely understand but have never given it enough time and Virgo thought to <laughs> give it the appropriate name, Beat Orphanage. <laughs> I like this, sir. I'm mm -hmm. learning a lot. I'm sorry, proceed. <laughs> um, what happens with my tracks is they go through many stages. Uh, it might get a, a certain kind of... Uh, it will have a certain sound that is at the beginning and then that evolves. Sometimes I will choose to, if the bass line is strong, I may choose to make that the melody and put, uh, when I play this track a little later, you'll see that the bass line is um, outlined with an opera voice. And so the two together um, then gel. Um, 
a little bit like uh, Jimi Hendrix's uh, manic depression <laughs> guitar and bass in unison. Mm. There's something very powerful about that. So I, um, so if something raises its hand and says, I have. I am the hook, or I am the melody, or I am the front of the picture, then I will pay attention to that and try and, and, and add to it, either in unison or by harmonic complement. It's funny because as much as it's methodical, it's very natural too. You're not necessarily compartmentalizing, you've just given things like, like really smart titles and it's just so, fi it's filed away so, so neatly. Do you, are you like a neat person? Or is this just um, like, this is just the, 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 the neatness is basically a concept in your head? Yeah, I'm, I'm very neat with my tools. Um, this is a beautiful upright Steinway piano that I lo love the sound of, but it was a bit rickety. It, was, you know, it had fallen into disarray in the inside, so I had it rebuilt. Uh, and uh, the, the rebuild was a success. So that's a very beautiful, reliable piece and great for songwriting and just an all-around good instrument to have in the studio. So I, I like to, um, if I find a piece like this and I nurture it and it becomes a sound station, then I cherish it and respect it. Uh, and I, it's the same way with all my tools. You know, if, if, I, if, I find, if I find a microphone that I love, then I hang on to it and everything gets, uh, has a position in the shop. That, so if you, if you need, a certain kind of job done, you know that you can rely on a certain tool, hand-picked. Mm. And this is certainly, you know, probably one of the, the, one of the uh, most fascinating studio spaces I've been in in my life. It's pretty, it's, uh, it's pretty next level. It's pretty wild. Uh, and, and we mix um, modern technology with antique stuff, you know, like this, this box up here is a, um, what they call a, a Poltec equalizer, sure. um, made in the 50s, uh -huh. and it's hard to beat it even today. We had a little showdown uh, a couple of weeks ago trying different EQs, and that, that one won out still. <laughs> so, and it's just an old tube piece of equipment. Um, um, and then what's above is called a Teletronics LA-2A. Mm. Uh, it's a tube compressor, and it works on optics, so it's very, very graceful. So that makes a nice pair. So that's a little, that's a little vocal station right there. So you put the vocals through that and you get that magic, magic sound. See, you're definitely like an experienced producer. Like this is an experienced producer speaking, people. Um, but let me ask you this, does that, um, do you think that that helps you in being a, a, a great performer, being, ex being an, uh, an experienced producer? I, I've found over the years that one feeds the other. Um, um, I like the studio because um, it's my place of invention. Mm. Uh, and then the stage has a whole other dynamic because the stage, um, you are communicating directly with an audience. The audience feeds the band, and yes. the band feeds the audience. And energy. There's, there's incredible energy and there are things that'll, that'll happen in a live situation that could never happen in the studio. But I respect that that has happened and I try and bring it into the studio. Uh, consequently, I've made a lot of records that, where we've not even used headphones, we just use a full-on PA, everybody in the room slamming it out. And um, so the, the live energy has been captured on a few records that I've worked on because of that. How much time do you, in your schedule, how much time do you get to commit to being creative and, you know, essentially just pulling from your emotions? Um, I mean, because you have your own studio, so it's not yeah. about, like, you know, studio time at this point in your life, right? Yeah, the... Um, it's just more about, like... Not, not about studio. Actually, it's, it's about um, isolated time, which gets harder and harder to come by the busier you are. I'm sure you've noticed it yourself, you know. Sure. Like a, um, I find that th those moments, oftentimes in the morning, it's the best time for me to go to an instrument because no phone calls and and um, is it that or is it that our creative juices are running running at a different level when it's early? Because I've I there was a time where I spent four days in the studio and I did like from six in the morning to about maybe ten or eleven, and I did like. 
uh, 10 songs in like four days. Oh. Great and I never you. forgot that because it was, to me, it was just kind of like, okay, this, there's something to this, you know, yeah. six, seven in the morning thing. Is yeah. it that for you or is it really that you believe, you know, there are no interruptions, no distractions? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you're fresh, for sure. Right. At that time in the morning, you've not said anything. Great time to sing, actually, because your voice is a little, deep, a little deeper. And I always, I was a newspaper delivery boy as a kid. I delivered the morning paper and I, I love being on my own delivering the paper. And, and, and I think that's what got my imagination going. And so uh, those early mornings in the studio, I think, um, bring that feeling back for me. Uh, but what do you think of this? Um, late at night, we are satisfied with slower rhythm. So if you make a, a, a nighttime record, as I made with Bob Dylan, this Old Mercy record we made in New Orleans, um, he didn't want to work in the day. He said, Daniel, please, only work at night. If you do mixes, make, make them at night, because he really wanted to make a, a real dripping nighttime record. And I think there's some truth to it, that the, we chill at night and the rhythm's, you know, maybe four or five BPM slower. That's all right. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I, I, I have to say, this is probably one of the most educational um, talks I've had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just learning, like, so much. What are you not properly being recognized for? Um, I'm very rhythmic, and I'm a little bit, and I love hip-hop records because I think they got the best bottom and the best grooves. Um, Can I just tell you something, though? Sure. I, and people may not want to hear this, but like, I don't want to hear bottom anymore. Oh. I'm so bottomed out. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, um, I, but it's just so much. Yes. I mean, there are records where there's essentially nothing but 808s. <laughs> right. <laughs> Literally. It's just like, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's been said that you um, see recording as like basically documenting, right? So it's also manipulating and distorting. So how do you find, um, what, what, what do you feel like is the best balance between those two? Yeah. Well, the, the documenting part is the documenting of, of time, what, what, what's going on in people's lives at that time, emotionally and otherwise. Um, once you understand why you're there, then, and you've got something on the go, then that's when manipulations come in. That's when sonic um, um, modifications and manipulations come in. I've worked with some very smart people who are um, devoted to um, sort of sonic experiment. Um, Brian Eno, of course, and, and uh, The Edge from U2, and, um, Flood, there's an engineer named Flood that I work with on a good few records. Um, that, group, that group of heads um, at a given time was very, very devoted to breaking new ground sonically. And we managed to pull it off a few times, you know, and uh, going back to what we were talking about in the 80s, we discovered the sound, uh, the sound that Eno and myself uh, designed in, in, uh, in Canada. It's this very atmospheric sound, very orchestral sound. And we were able to bring that to, to the lads in Dublin. And uh, so there, that's an example of something that we were very devoted to and spent years working on. And it was really our sound. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice to, uh, it was very nice to share it with those people. Um, so, so finding new sounds is a very, um, it's a big priority for me. Um, and it's not easy because uh, it's much easier to just reference old records, you know, yeah. like to what they did in the 70s, or maybe there's a great drum sample to be had from back in the day, a James Brown record. And so you get instant vibe by a quick sample. And I like that technology okay, but I think it's when I look at the man in the mirror. It's it, so much cooler. If we can say um, we actually invented something. Yeah. And that's, that makes me happy. It's funny, you, you make sounds and I go looking for them. Okay. Um, I very, very rarely make sounds. When I do, it's been drums and it's just like, 
buckets on the two and four yeah. just because I want like a harder attack on a mm -hmm. snare or something or sometimes I've just done uh, you know drum patterns with like a lot of <laughs> you gotta be kidding um, well look you know bottom in <laughs> you know, it's important Thank on some you. level right um, but I personally like um, I just I just think that things should love. just be rare and you know, spontaneous, right? <laughs> you know, music music is supposed to hit you spontaneously, you know? Just like, ooh, what was that? Let me see that again. <laughs> or let me hear that again. So, you know. Well, listen, in support of what you're saying, some of the byproducts that come to me in a day are more interesting than the thing we've been uh, working on for three or four days, mm -hmm. so I think there'll be like a, a tiny little thing. It's like, whoa, let's, let's go that direction, and that's <laughs> it, right? And that's it. And we're we can afford to do that because you know we don't have massive film crews around. We're just we're just it's just a studio with three or four people in, in my case. So the many times the the, the byproduct that came, came my way will be the thing that I pursue, and it ends up being more interesting than what I set out to do. So. What keeps, you, what keeps you really, really honestly interested in music? I wake up with ideas and I dream about ideas, you know, when I'm going to bed. Oh, I, I, I visualize sound and it's... So you're a synesthete. It's like a blessing and a curse. I, I can never get away from it. I'm telling so, you there's something to it, guys. There's and something I, to it. I'll, be, I'll have to get up and write the idea down and some, in the morning, same thing. And I, but like you, you're, you're, so you're a synesthete. Did, did you know this all, like synesthesia? Did you know that you had this all your life? No, I guess I never heard the term. <laughs> yeah, but you, so every day, huh? Every day, and the more that I, uh, like if I set up my, my steel guitar and I go at it and I play it every day, after about 10 days, I, I feel that I've really got a handle on the sound. And I'm a master at it, and that's really the time when I should be recording. Um, can I play it for you? Sure. <laughs> that I call the raindrop sound. Okay, that was incredible. Oh, thanks. thanks. Do you understand yeah. what that could do to somebody with a joint? Uh, yeah, it happens all the time around here. I mean, when's the water girl coming back? <laughs> you need more water, I mean, you know. No, no, I mean, I'll maybe see what else she, she's got happening in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Get me a whiskey, honey. <laughs> So in the 60s, you talk about the rise of recording. 
uh, and live recording. Uh, I know my opinion on this, but do you think that live music will, will you know, it's, actually, it's essentially making a comeback now, right? Well, li live music will never go away, and I think people are thrilled to um, go and see their fa favorite acts on the road again, yeah. you know, and, and, and then every little nightclub's got a band in it, so it's, um, I don't think we could ever, um, we could never get away from congregation, because we like, you know, human beings, we like to hook up, and really have a good time, and party. So I, th I think as, as music travels as much as it has through technology, I think we're going to see a return of just a good, that good local club with the dance band. We need that. We need that. And I, I, I feel it now, personally. So, like, if you had the, you had the opportunity to make, like, the ultimate band set up, what would it be? How would you set it up? Guitars? I would, I would uh, I'd have horns. Yeah. I love horns. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, but I, I like horns. The, As you wish. Yeah, yeah. Here, brother. <laughs> I like a horn section. I like the Fela Kuti kind of horns, uh, old James Brown horns. Um, and then I'd have, uh, of course, a smoke and rhythm section. Um, There's a smoke and rhythm section that just walked off. <laughs> um, now, scoring. You scored some major films. Uh, Sling Blade, Million Dollar Hotel. Um, do you like that, and what do you find different um, between? Um, and I, I've been asked that question before, but what do you feel like the differences between that and like you know, doing albums? Um, scoring, I, I like scoring because it's, you're serving someone else's vision and work. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you get off the, uh, the songwriting hook. You say, okay, I'm not I'm not the front of the picture. Mm -hmm. Some, the picture's already made. So now we will supply. Uh, an emotion or support to uh, enhance a scene. Um, and when I get it right, I think that my music is cinematic. It create, you know, you can see images from my music. So it's, I'd love to do more soundtrack work. Um, um, I don't want to do too much, right. because I don't want to be a, you know, the guy who does too many soundtracks and you become like a monkey in a corner, you know, just yeah, sure. repeating yourself. But I, I, like, I like the idea of making a contribution to a great film sure. now and again. At, and we got lucky on that film Sling Blade. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton had made a great film, and he liked my music. And we got together, and he was, he was like a saint, you know? He just let me do whatever yeah. I wanted. How's it going, man? Good to see you. How's everything, man? Good to see you. Okay. I got a nice track up on the burner. Oh, you do? Cool. You want to hear it? Oh, I'd love to, yeah. Let's go. He, he was kind of my director. He'd come in after a couple of days, so try that one in this scene, and could you slow over, try this one, slow it down, and play it on the organ. And mm. so I, I really enjoyed working with Billy Bob. So I, I see um, soundtrack work as a potential one-to-one uh, -one collaboration. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned there was something that you were going to play that I can't wait to hear. Right? Yeah. Um, what I'm going to play you, the rhythm of it was invented a few years ago. It's a Roland 808, and it's got a, a, a very intricate delay on it, so uh, the pattern gets, goes, goes off into a regenerated uh, spin. Mm. And then you'll hear this opera voice sound, and then some what I call my dub samples. They're textural samples. I just take um, an already existing sound extrapolate and expand on it. I'll let you hear some of those as well because they're quite fascinating. Um, so no keyboards were used on this. It's, it's, it's all like sampling machines and sound manipulation, which I kind of live for. <laughs> wow. You want to go up to the console? Check sure. With me? Bringing our, you know, yeah, yeah, our we gift bring from it. the rhythm section? Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> um, Bring in the opera voice. I'll now bring in the uh, the 808.
comes the bass. That was like, to me, that sounded like a U2 record made for like a Kubrick film. Okay, let's give him a call. I mean, Bono, did you hear this? <laughs> Edge? That was amazing. Yeah, thanks buddy. Dude, uh, man, I don't know how to say thank you other than to say thank you for like having us in like your yeah. castle. Yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in to yeah. uh, Artist Talk and this genius here, Daniel yeah, but, Lenoir. Thank you so much. So yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, man. Where in our society do the crazy ideas really get tried? It's the entrepreneurs. It's the small teams of guys and girls who are so passionate about making something happen, they're willing to risk everything for something they believe in. It's always the craziest ideas. Most of the world just might not be looking at it from the same angle. Thousands of years from now, we're going to be looking back at these next few decades mm -hmm. as the moment in time where the human race left Earth and became a multi-planetary species. Ultimately, our goal is to go back to from whence we came, star stuff. Pharrell Williams here. Hi, I'm Joy Bryant. I'm Eric Ripper. I'm Tom Colicchio. I'm Dr. Frank Lippmann. The host of On the Table. The host of Across the Board. Host of Artist Talk. Host of Hooked Up. Host of the show, Be Well Week, Be Well Weekend, on the Reserve Channel. It's only on Reserve. Did you know that you can follow my show on social media sites like Facebook? Follow us on Twitter. If you're a fan of my show, hit the like button. All of the above. Share me with your friends. Treat yourself. Yeah, check out a new episode of my show, Hooked Up. And if you want to leave comments, feedback, ideas, whatever, love to hear from you. Leave a comment. And if you don't want to miss the show, be sure to subscribe. The one that's like down here, or is it here? Uh, somewhere down here. Thanks for watching the Reserve Channel. Only on YouTube. Throw caution to the wind and ask yourself what rules.